Uh, thanks, uh, Tracy. So, uh, Don Bubar, believe it or not, I've been running uh, Avalon as a publicly traded company in this uh, specialty metals and mineral space for over 20 years now, actually, and have seen quite an evolution in the space from uh, when I first started with our lithium project, where these were basically um, little known, little appreciated, and very poorly understood. Uh, emerging commodities to where we are now, where this is becoming quite an important uh, subsector of the uh, mineral industry, particularly with this whole evolution of um, the battery industry, energy storage technology, electric vehicles is creating this whole new demand that we never saw uh, or could perhaps see coming in the distant future 20 years ago. But it's definitely upon us now, and it's uh, changed the game in some very dramatic ways. So I think it's time that uh, this subsector of the mineral industry really look at how it wants to brand itself, because it is such a different sector of the mineral industry. We've refer to these as commodities, but they're really not commodities in the traditional sense of the term. They don't trade on commodity exchanges. They're really highly refined chemical products that you need to produce for uh, specific applications in the, uh, in the marketplace. And so there's a lot of new terminology starting to emerge on this. I know an investor Intel has used uh, uh, technology metals. Uh, you hear energy metals being used quite a bit now. Advanced materials, clean tech materials, that's one that I kind of like. Well, I think we should all think about um, how we want to brand this industry to really differentiate it from the traditional mining industry, which is very, very different in terms of the risk factors and so that we don't confuse investors about what those risks in the business are. Let's face it, most traditional mining investors just are commodity price speculators at, at the end of the day, <clears throat> whereas in this industry, it's more about the growth opportunities that these emerging commodities are presenting to uh, investors. And so I say, um, now that I'm hearing the uh, blockchain developers and Bitcoin developers adopting the word mining, I say they can have it. They're the miners now. We're going to be clean tech producers, pr clean tech materials producers. <clears throat> There's your reminder on forward-looking information. So as I said, we've been around for over 20 years now, and uh, I'm a veteran of this uh, technology metal space. <clears throat> and um, as a result of that, we've done many, many equity financings over the years. So uh, we have some 20 to 25,000 shareholders all over. And since the uh, rare earth bubble burst there a few years ago, we've seen a big uh, turnover in our shareholder base, which has kind of depressed our uh, valuation. But on the other hand, we do have a very large audience out there that follow us around the world. And once we get some traction on one of these projects we're working on, then uh, we should um, be able to really build on that solid base. Another thing that differentiates Avalon, and in addition to the commodities we focus on over the years, is uh, we embrace sustainability as core to our business early on, recognizing if you're going to try to produce materials for clean technology, it makes sense to try to do that in a sustainable, clean way, embracing the principles of environmental and social responsibility. We did that. We built it into the culture of the company. We been producing a GRI compliance sustainability report for six years now and continue to get recognition for that actually actually just got recognized for the third time by corporate night magazine as one of their future 40 um, uh, responsible corporate leaders in Canada so in terms of our overall sustainable development strategy <clears throat> what is a sustainable development strategy in this space well, we define it by focusing on those materials that are relevant to clean technology as kind of number one, and then think about how to design that operation to minimize the overall environmental impacts that you're going to have on the environment, and start planning even before you started how you're going to um, uh, make productive use out of that land post-closure. Many mining companies don't even think about that until they're getting near the end. You really should think about it even before you start to work on that new uh, mineral deposit. 
And then focus on pro process efficiency. <clears throat> How can you process that material to minimize the amount of waste you generate and maximize the amount of valuable material you can extract from that, uh, that rock you're taking out of the ground and do it in a way that meets your customers' expectations on uh, product quality. Another thing we're applying is that's different from the traditional mining industry. Miners always want to make the next mine the biggest they possibly can, the biggest, richest mineral deposit. But it doesn't really have to be that way. And the, traditionally in the mining industry, you'd start small, follow the vein, and get bigger over time as, as you understood the resource and saw the opportunities. <clears throat> Actually, by applying that sort of stage development approach, starting small and building scalability in the project, you can actually manage a lot of the risks inherent in the business in terms of environmental impacts and as well as investment risks. Start at a modest scale, understand what you're doing, build some scalability into it, but then something goes wrong at the start in terms of perhaps the chemistry of your discharge water, then you can fix it before it causes a huge environmental disaster at the end of the day. So I think there's um, a component of the stage development approach and environmental responsibility, as well as managing uh, investment risks by not overbuilding it too quickly and then finding maybe your product is not gonna be accepted in the marketplace at the end of the day. And lastly, if you're working in Canada and anywhere in Northern Canada, you really have to work with the local indigenous peoples. Our principle has always been and still is engage early and often and try to find ways to collaborate on opportunities to share in the rewards of the business and create opportunities for partnerships as well as job creation and training. So as I said, we've been a diversified player in the space for some time. That's been really part of our strategy is uh, accumulate a portfolio of assets that give us exposure to a broad range of these technology metals and have ourselves positioned to move a project forward into production when the opportunity is created by new technology creating that, that demand. A few years ago, we thought it was going to be rare earths and got awfully close with our uh, Nechalacho project. Right now, we've been focusing more on our uh, uh, separation rapids lithium project for obvious reasons, but it's interestingly enough, we're now seeing opportunities to advance all three of them at the same time because of new circumstances with rare earths and, uh, and tin. Nice problem to have, but um, it's creating quite a bit of work for, uh, for our team these days. So I'd like to give you a little bit of a snapshot on each of these uh, projects. And I'll try and do that in the time I have available here. So starting off with separation wrap is lithium. <laughs> this was our first foray into the wonderful world of these uh, clean tech materials, uh, new discovery back in 1996, started working on it in the late 90s, initially as a, an opportunity to serve the glass industry. This was an unusual lithium pegmatite enriched in the mineral petalite, not a common lithium mineral, but a valued industrial mineral in the glass sector, and still is actually. And we nearly got it going then, except for a change in the marketplace there that frustrated that opportunity that, at that time. But we've hung on to it knew it would have another day, could see that probably a lithium battery would become something bigger even back in the late 90s. And sure enough, that's what uh, we're seeing now and provided an opportunity to reactivate it a few years. In the meantime, we've kept our uh, tenure in place, made it more secure under a mining lease, maintained our community relationships there. We've got good access and a 10 million ton open pitable resource that's ready to mine when the uh, opportunity arises which perhaps is just arriving now. It has two minerals in the resource, petalite and lepidolite. <clears throat> and um, lepidolite is another opportunity for us we didn't even recognize early on. It's now starting to be used more as an input for making uh, lithium battery materials from. And in fact, um, we now are talking about collaborating with uh, our good friends at Lepidico. I don't know if Joe Walsh is here today. But uh, Lepidico are planning to build their phase one demonstration plant for their process to make lithium carbonate from lepidolite in Sudbury. And uh, we hope to be their um, uh, supplier of their initial uh, lepidolite needs for that, uh, that plant. And that would be an important byproduct for us, but petalite is still the dominant mineral uh, 
in the resource that's creating the opportunity. And so we, no one had ever made a battery material from it before. So over the last couple of years, that's what we focused on was how do you make a battery material and actually innovated our own process uh, to make lithium hydroxide from Petalite, made in fine products, been proven in the NMC uh, cathode chemistry already by the NRC. And we know we can do it at a low cost. We think we can improve on that, but that's uh, definitely a, a path that we can uh, follow here now. But it's also got potential as an industrial mineral and glass, and we're still looking at that too. So we've got a number of options open to us, including producing uh, lipidolite as a byproduct for Lipidico and other uh, users of that. The glass industry, though, is, is uh, a very interesting opportunity for us. Nobody's talking about it. Everybody's talking about lithium batteries, but the glass industry is still a very big consumer of lithium. And these high-strength glass products that are becoming more popular now, things like Gorilla, uh, gorilla Glass made by Corning, the critical ingredient in all of them is lithium, and there is no substitute. And what's happening now is there's now struggling to find adequate supplies of lithium, and that's kind of opened the door again for an emerging producer like us with the ideal form of lithium for the glass applications to serve that market. And we've actually done some more work on how to create a, uh, a product for them that meets their quality re requirements. And um, we've come up with something that my colleague Pierre has branded super pedalite because it's super clean in its quality. And that's really important to the, uh, the end users and creating a good opportunity for us to serve that market. So based on that understanding and having uh, multiple kind of market opportunities, we're gonna take the staged approach and what we want to do is uh, start by, at a modest scale, get into production, produce the industrial minerals product, which we think we can do for in the order of $50 million, start making money on that, and then on the back of that, have a pilot plant to prove up our battery material product, see where we can fit into that uh, market best in terms of the different forms that are being used now, and then have another scale up on the back of that production, initial production of the industrial minerals products to serve that industry uh, going forward. We think that's the uh, most logical and lowest risk way to get initiated in this uh, lithium business, especially considering how dynamic an industry it is, as Dan explained earlier, with the uh, types of chemistries being used and batteries changing all the time and inevitably the material inputs as well. And quickly, this another thing about this resource, if you want to be sustainable, there's, these are great deposits to work on. There's nothing poisonous in them that, can, that represents an issue uh, from, for the environment. <clears throat> on to tin quickly, and uh, this is a slide that um, was shared by the International Tin Association with its members from a presentation done by Rio Tinto on a study they commissioned at MIT, so a very credible source that rank the metals in terms of their imp being impacted by new technology, and guess what? Number one on the list was tin, who'd have thunk, eh? It outranks lithium and cobalt, in fact. And uh, I think this is just a reflection of the fact that tin has a lot of potential in many of these emerging uh, clean technologies. And maybe they haven't been fully realized yet, but there's a lot of work uh, being done to see how they can uh, contribute in positive ways to many of these technologies, and there's huge growth potential there. And that's great news for us because we've been working on a tin project for over 10 years now, looking at trying to um, redevelop the old East Kempfield tin mine, which closed in 1992 when the price of tin dropped very dramatically. And it's been basically on uh, <coughs> a closed mine site ever since, but lots of resources left in the ground. And we see an opportunity there now that we're working on actually redevelop it by taking advantage of the fact there's a whole lot of waste that was left on surface that with using, uh, taking advantage of current prices and new technology, we can recover a tin concentrate and make money while we clean up the site. So we've created a whole uh, concept around that. Six million tons of previously mined ore sitting there oxidizing, you see the orange color, generating acid mine drainage and uh, creating a problem for the environment that we can clean up and make money while we do it. 
So we're going to try to uh, develop a plan around that. And it's, again, a relatively low capex for something like $30 million. Now we can put this in production in less than a year, start making money. Not a huge amount of money, but for a company with no revenue, any amount of money is uh, welcome. And uh, get ourselves uh, into small-scale production with the potential to scale it up uh, going forward and clean up the acid mine drainage issue um, there. And if I can get two more minutes, Tracy, I'll just touch on rarers. I love the tin angle. Could you tell me what technology apps you use for the tin? <clears throat> well, it's used now as um, in um, solders for electronics. So it's in every electronic product now on the circuit board for the solders. So it has those conductive properties that give it application in a broader range of things now. And it's being talked about in some new types of lithium ion battery cathode chemistries. It's already being used in renewable energies and solar panels. Indium tin oxide is, is, is part of that chemistry. And there's a whole bunch more uh, that we're just learning about ourselves actually that are on the, on the radar screen. Yeah, so tin is a fascinating opportunity. If I have two more minutes, just touch on, um, on Thor Lake and Nechalacho. That was our rare earth project. We had to put it on hold about four years ago when uh, the rare earth bubble burst and all the interest uh, evaporated. And with the Molly Core fiasco in the, in the U.S., investors have just lost interest in rare earths totally. In fact, it's almost like rare earths are a dirty word with uh, investors south of the border now. They don't even want to hear about it, let alone invest in it. But as you heard earlier yesterday from, uh, from Gavin and Nick, uh, rare earths are coming back. There's no doubt about it. They're vital in uh, electric vehicle technology now too, as you heard them talk about. And um, so there's a couple of opportunities or reasons now for us to look at reactivating uh, Nechalacho. And that interest in rare earths is one, but also Northwest Territories is looking at uh, alternatives on improving infrastructure there. And one of the things they're focusing on is, is how they can bring um, <clears throat> clean energy to the north. The north side of the lake here around Yellowknife does not have enough uh, access to hydropower to service needs, so they're relying on fossil fuels. And there's a plan now to bring uh, hydropower from this dam north, north of the lake, and the route they're looking at would bring it right by us at Thor Lake here and give us access to um, hydropower, greatly uh, reduce our uh, energy costs, and actually we're Perhaps part of the justification for that route is being a potential customer for the product. And they're also talking about extending this road out to the shore here too, uh, along this transmission line, which provide access to this new proposed park out here in the community of Utsul Kay. So we might actually be able to take advantage of this with much improved uh, infrastructure. And then, of course, uh, we heard yesterday about how there's a soaring demand for neodymium, praseodymium, um, with electric motors and electric vehicles requiring this now. And um, while we looked at a, a model based mostly on the heavy rare earth potential at uh, Nechalacho, there are some discrete zones there that are very, very rich in neodymium, praseodymium that uh, we think we have an opportunity on, plus there's a whole lot of lithium there that we haven't even really begun to uh, look at, including lipidolite, that'll make Joe Walsh happy there at, uh, at uh, Lipidico. <clears throat> so uh, what are we doing is we're going now to sort of uh, take advantage of this this year, to start studying the possibilities, and again, looking at a small scale development model, see if we can take advantage of these small, very rich resources, easy to access and get in production in the near term and bring a supply of neodymium, praseodymium concentrates uh, to serve this rapidly growing market in electric vehicles. And maybe I'll leave it there. Thanks for giving me some extra time. <laughs> <laughs>